uh, recently went to a resort in, in Puerto Rico. And if you've never been to a resort uh, with a redhead, let me tell you that all the stereotypes are true. I'm the guy that hides on the beach and gets an umbrella right away. I'm the guy that reapplies sunscreen uh, every couple of hours. And so I I don't enjoy the sun as much as some of my uh, tan friends do. Uh, One of the things that I enjoy is is people watching. And so when we were there, I found myself uh, just checking out groups of people, kind of taking them in and and sizing them up. I had a chance to meet uh, some people from Canada, and found out that uh, the, the stereotype's generally true, that they, they really do end most sentences with the word A. Uh, they didn't like when I told them that, but I told them that anyway. Uh, I had a chance to meet uh, some friends from Texas, and I love the way that they can work the word y'all into any sentence. I don't know why, but they do. It's great, isn't it? Uh, actually, and I promise I'm not making this up, I met some people from England uh, and they invited me to have afternoon tea. And I was like, oh, this is just like a movie, right? Uh, and I, I, my, my favorite group of people uh, that we, we connected with, we saw a couple different groups of people uh, from Boston. And maybe you know some Boston stereotypes, but I was able to share with them. I said, oh, my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law uh, recently moved to, to Boston. And they're like, oh, what part? And I said, Quincy. And they're like, Quincy? And I said, Quincy, you know? And they said, Quincy. And I was like, Sure, yeah. And I felt like they were yelling at me, but I don't think they were. And then they said, uh, it's down by the haba. And I was like, I don't know if that accent's good, by the way. It's terrible, right? But I, I was like, yes, perhaps it is down by the haba, right? You know, uh, and, and it, it kind of just reinforced this, this thing that I'd known all along. When you hang out with a group of people, you can tell who they are and where they're from. When you hang out with a group of people, you can tell who they are and where they're from. In fact, uh, in the book of Acts, that was actually said about some of the disciples of Jesus. That was, that was said about Peter and John. People said, you can tell that these men have been with Jesus. People could, could tell who they were and, and where they'd been based on spending time with them. Do you ever wonder what people see in you or who they're seeing in you as they spend time with you? Also, while we were uh, on vacation there in Puerto Rico, I'd get to know these different groups of people and we'd be talking and inevitably it comes up where someone says, so what do you do for a living? And I think I've shared this before in my line of work. Sometimes that can be a real conversation killer. Sometimes I'm tempted to say something like, oh, I work in the nonprofit world or or something like that because you just know that that things are gonna get awkward because when you say, oh, I work for a church or, oh, I'm a pastor, people say some version of, oh, I used to go to church or I grew up going to church or maybe they'll just flat out tell you, yeah, Christians are kind of mean or Christians are weird or I've got some Christians I kind of had a a fight with or they're really getting at this. They're saying, "Uh, Christians are kind of hypocrites. You ever, you ever wonder if that could be said of you or if that's said about you? You ever wonder if, if people would say that your beliefs and your life or your beliefs and your actions don't quite add up, the two aren't connected? But we wanna take a moment this morning and we wanna jump into that question. Can people tell who we are and what we're about when they spend time with us and do our beliefs and our actions match up? And to do that, we want to look at a passage in the book of 1 John. And so if you want to go ahead and and turn there, you've probably got a Bible under your seat around you there somewhere. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. It's on page 743 on that Bible. And we're in a a series called the Trilogy, just looking at the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. They were written by the Apostle John or the disciples. And and he wrote uh, some other books in the Bible, but he specifically wrote these books because the church was under attack. There were lies that were being spread and he kind of had to just cut through all of the lies, all of the noise and say, here's what you need to know. Here's what it looks like to stand on the gospel. Here's what it looks like to walk in light. Don't listen to these other things. Don't be distracted or pulled away by these other things. This is our foundation. And so we're taking seven weeks to to just look through these books. And today we're in chapter two, verses one through six. It says this in 1 John 2, Verse one, page 743. It says, my dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. 
and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Well, John starts off this passage and and says, my dear children, and I don't want you to think that he's literally writing this to his children. He's just an aging pastor who has a love and affinity for this group of people. And he's saying, listen, I care about you. These are some things I want you to know. This is what is important. And he says, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. Well, what is this? This is this book that we've come to call 1 John. And, and this book focuses us on the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that we can know Jesus and be changed by Jesus. And last week, Blake, our director of family ministries, opened us up, took us to chapter one and, and talked about three ways that we can walk in the light. He said that we can practice the truth, know the truth about sin, and confess sin. And the second part of that is we continue to learn how to walk in light is simply this, that we put aside sin. Some people use the gospel as an excuse to sin. Some people say, well, Jesus knows me and he forgives it all so I can kind of live how I want and do what I want. But when viewed properly, the fact that Jesus came and gave his life for us and transforms us should compel us to live out of the gospel, to honor him and to do our best to put aside sin. There's a word for that. And the word is sanctification. If you come to the back table at the end and say it to me, I'll give you a dollar, right? It's the, it's the word of the day, but sanctification simply means this. It's the process of maturing and growing to be set apart for God's special use. Philippians 2.12 says it this way, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. When Jesus changes us, our lives, our behaviors, and our actions should change. And so John says, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. And then he says this, but if anyone does sin, he knows he's human. He knows we're human and he knows that's still going to happen. And so he says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the father. Well, an advocate is, is simply someone who supports a cause. And so you may be an advocate for many different things in your life. Maybe you know someone who's advocating for a cause, but this advocate, our advocate, Jesus, the advocate is not just supporting a cause. He's pleading for this cause and he's worked for this cause by giving his life. And so even though you and I are lost in sin, he's giving his life. I think the best word picture that we can have for being lost in sin is if someone were to push me into a pit of mud right now. I would be covered in mud. I would be owned by mud. Mud would be on every part of my body. And when you and I step away from God's design and think that we know better and think that our way is smarter, sin takes over our lives. And and so when we look at ourselves, we are covered in sin. We are walking toward death. We are lost and separated from God. And yet because that Jesus is our advocate, he comes and he, to give you another word picture, he, he drapes a a white towel or a white sheet over us. And so when God looks at us, when God is looking at our lives, he does not see our sin. He sees the work of Jesus and how Jesus has purified us. We have an advocate who pleads our case before the father. It goes on to say, he is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Your advocate is not just a a guy who's trying hard or sort of doing his best. Your advocate is the one who was without sin. Our advocate is the one who did not sin. Verse two says this, he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. Jesus is the sacrifice, knowing that we were covered in sin. We were covered in mud who came and gave his life and sacrificed his life on our behalf to pay the price for our sins. His life was literally given to pay a debt. And his sacrifice atones for our sins. This verse even tells us that Jesus died for the sins of the world. So you don't have to wonder if he was also the sacrifice for you. You don't have to wonder if you're good enough to earn this atonement. You can know and trust that when he came and gave his life, it was to pay the price for the sins of the world. And his desire would be that you recognize that. Jesus is our advocate who atones for our sins. 
Jesus is our advocate who atones for our sins. If I can boil everything we've said down so far into one line, that would be it. And please don't forget that. This means that we can know Jesus. We can walk in light. We can be transformed. And that is the gospel. That's the foundation. That's everything that we need to know to build from here and then take next steps. And here's the next step. Verse three says this, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. We can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. How can we be sure that we know him? Doesn't that seem to go against the gospel and go against what was just shared and talking about scales? We have to follow these commandments now and earn God's love and somehow buy our way into heaven? No, no, that's not what's being said here. What's being said is that it's impossible to know him and not have your heart changed. And it's impossible to have your heart changed and not have your behavior and your life and your actions and your function changed. A person who knows God will obey his commandments. A person who knows God will obey his commandments. That doesn't say a person who knows of God or a person who says they believe in him. It doesn't say a person who goes to church. It doesn't say any of those things. It says someone who knows him. And so it's talking about a relationship. It's talking about intimacy. A person who knows God will obey his commandments. This is someone who has a relationship with God, someone growing in intimacy with God, someone who has trusted him and surrendered to him. That person will obey God's commands. Verse four says this way, if someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. If you know God, you've been changed by God. You're being changed by God and you will continue to be changed by God as you are in relationship with him, as you are practicing intimacy with him, as you are getting to know him and his character is rubbing off on you. If you know God, you will obey his commandments. You won't do that out of obligation. You'll do that out of love and admiration. His word will shape you. If you claim to know God, but don't obey God, you're a liar. Obedience is a natural response to relationship. And obedience is a natural response to admiration. Verse five says this, but those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. I think we could say it this way. Your obedience to God's word tells the story of your love for him. Your obedience to God's word tells the story of your love for him. It tells the story. It doesn't earn your salvation. It doesn't balance the scale. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says it this way. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. This is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ, nothing more, nothing less, but there is a direct connection between what's going on in our life and our heart if we're knowing Jesus, if we're in relationship with him, and our obedience, and we can't ignore that correlation. Your obedience does not save you. Your actions don't save you but they do tell the story of God's love to the world. I mean, think about it. We just had people up here saying, Jesus has changed my life and I want to be obedient to him. And they got to tell that story to you. Some of those people were wearing shorts. They weren't wearing shorts because it's intelligent today, right? Some of you were like, what are these people doing in shorts? It's like, oh, they're, they're getting baptized. Okay, I thought this was like a swimming trunks church or something. I wasn't sure, right? They weren't doing it because it made sense. They were doing that because they were compelled by the love of Jesus and they want to be obedient and they're obeying the things he's put in their heart, the things he's put in his word. And when you connect the dots on that, that makes sense. And so their, their obedience is telling the story of God's love. Our obedient actions show completely how we love God. And they give us affirmation and clarity that we're living in him. How else would we know we're doing this thing right? How else would we know that we're not hypocrites? God says, this is what it looks like to live for me. This is what it looks like to obey my commands. This is what it looks like to have intimacy with me. And so the question that we can ask ourselves is, what story is your obedience telling? 
What story is your life telling? What story are your actions telling? Our life and our obedience to God's word will tell the story of our love for him. Verse six says this, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And I don't think I can say that better. So let's just officially make it our big idea for the day because I think it encapsulates everything we've said so far. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. If you love God, you will live your life like Jesus did. If you love God, you will obey God's commands like Jesus did, like we see so clearly in the life and ministry of Jesus. If you are in submission to him, you will live like Jesus did. If he is your Lord, you will live like him. He will direct your life and direct your actions. And so I think a question that's, that's fair to ask, well, how did Jesus live? He was just really nice, right? And he talked to people and smiled a lot. Jesus boiled things down to two lines. He said that he wanted his life to be about this. He wants our lives to be about this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus loved God. Jesus had a relationship with God. He pursued God and had an intimacy with God. And he said that we should love our neighbor as ourself, that we should love people. We should support people. We should meet the needs of people, take the gospel to people. And so we saw in the life of Jesus, the conduct of Jesus, the function of Jesus, the behavior and the obedience to the commands of God. We saw Jesus doing this, walking with God, honoring God, living the heart of God, living the fruit of the spirit, and ultimately living in submission to the father because he was following after him. And so a person who knows God will obey God's commands. And our obedience will tell the story of how much we love him. And so I, I think naturally some of us think, all right, well, how do I do this obey commands thing? How do I, how do I make sure that's happening? How do I know that, that I'm being obedient? And I promise I'm not trying to be funny when I say this. You have to read God's word. I don't think anyone's shocked that that came out of a pastor's mouth today, but I mean it when I say it. To know God's commands, to obey God's commands, to trust God's commands and let them change you and change your behavior and permeate your life, you have to read them and know them. And so you have to spend time with God and spend time in God's word. How do we do that? Well, there's lots of ways to do that. But I think one of the best modern ways that you can do that is to redeem your phone. There's an app called YouVersion. It's one of the most popular apps in the world. It's got the whole Bible and it's got reading plans on it. And so when you get your break at work, instead of just scrolling through Instagram and numbing your mind, maybe you can say, I'm going to knock out a couple chapters today. Over the course of my lunch break over the year, I'm going to read the Old Testament, or I'm going to read the New Testament, or I'm going to do an in-depth study on the, the letters, the epistles in the New Testament, or the Gospels, or I'm going to read the whole Bible. You can use a, an old reading plan on a piece of paper. You can read a hardcover Bible, or you could redeem your phone because you take it everywhere with you and don't act like you don't, right? Right? We know that we have those with us and so we can redeem that and make sure that we're hiding God's word in our heart and learning from God and learning who God is and learning his commands so that they can come into our life and we can be obedient. But there's a point that that breaks down, right? There's a point that we, we would say, yeah, I'm supposed to read the Bible and know God's commands and yet that, that doesn't happen all the time. We read God's word, we study God's word, and we, we look at certain parts of it and we think like, all right, yeah, I like this. I like this part about uh, love. Love's a good, warm, fuzzy thing. And I like, um, I like this part about blessing. Sounds like God's gonna help me win the lottery if I, if I do this, right? That's pretty cool. I like the part that my kids have to obey me because now I'll never have to mow the yard again. And I, man, oh, have you guys seen this part about crushing my enemies? That's, that's pretty amazing. I've got a couple of those. It makes me feel real good. But, but the problem where our obedience falls apart is we don't want to obey all the parts of the Bible. We read things like this and we think like, I'm supposed to unconditionally love others. Well, I don't like that. Uh, serve people. 
That sounds complicated, right? Forgive, forgive others. Clearly God doesn't know my family, right? <laughs> care, care for those in need, okay? I've got student loans though. Uh, change, change my routine to pursue lost people. Eh, maybe, maybe on some weekends if there's time. One of God's commands is to, to rest and, and slow down. He clearly doesn't know all the things I have to do. He doesn't know the stress I'm under. He doesn't know what's happening in my life. So we remove that. Follow God's design for sex and relationships and gender and and marriage. That's not in my best interest these days for my career. I'm not going to do that. Treat my spouse a certain way. You have not met my spouse. I love you, honey. (laughs) Parent a certain way. Okay, submit to authority. No, be humble, listen. No, live in community. Do you know, does does he know how annoying people are these days? Live in community, share my life with people who are just gonna tell me their problems and tell me what's wrong with my life terrible idea. And so we remove these things. We take these things out and we, we look at scripture and we think like, oh, you want me to use my spiritual gifts? Nope, I'm good. I've got some things I'm good at, but I don't really want to extend those to people. And we're told that we should live the fruit of the spirit. Also don't want to do that. Make sure that we don't have any idols between us and God, things that are distracting us, things that are taking our attention, things that are robbing from God. And so we just think like, I don't want to do that. And the most terrible one, I think, we think we see like, die to myself? No. And we look at God's word and we ignore God's word or we remove things from God's word. We take things out of God's word and we make God's word about us. And so it's it's no longer God's word. It's the Mark approved parts of God's word that I'm interested in being obedient to and can tolerate in this season of my life. There was an old man in the, the church I grew up at. He used to say this line and at the time, I didn't think it was anything great. And I thought of it this week and it made me laugh. He used to say, if you're not hungry for God, you're probably full of yourself. If you're not hungry for God, you're probably full of yourself. And so when we're not knowing God and spending time with God and letting him be Lord, letting him tell us the secrets to life and what it means to have a full life and how to live for him, when we're ignoring parts of scripture and removing parts of scripture and only worrying about the commands that we want to obey that apply to us, we're making the Bible about us. We're ceasing to let it be the Bible and we're full of ourselves. I think it's so interesting because... I don't know if you know this, one of the reasons that John was writing this book specifically is because there was a group of people uh, who were called the Gnostics and and they were known for their belief about spirits and things. And so the the Bible clearly says that, that Jesus was fully man and fully God. And yet this group of people kind of rose up in the church, around the church, and were intermingling with the church. And they were saying, oh, you, you, someone told you that Jesus was a man and God? No, 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 no. He was, he was just a man. Or he was, he was just a spirit and they were attacking the integrity of the gospel. They were saying that Jesus didn't know the ways that we've suffered. He wasn't the first person to be without sin and so he wouldn't be an adequate sacrifice. And they were saying he wasn't God and so he wouldn't be able to be the sacrifice for our sins and defeat sin and death. And, and so they were just kind of tearing those pages and those things out of the Bible. And they're saying, see, it's still the Bible. And John's saying, no, 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 that's not the truth. Those pages belong in the Bible. We've got to put those things back. He was saying, if we're going to live for God, walk in the light, stand on a foundation of the gospel and be obedient to God's commands, we have to surrender to the whole thing. So how do we do that? How do we stand on the gospel? How do we obey God's commands? How do we live like Jesus and and also make sure that we don't ignore scripture? Well, there's just two two real quick ways I want to offer us as we're working toward the end of our, our day here. There are, there are two ways that we subtract from the Bible. Yes, it was a little exaggerated, tearing pages out. Don't worry, not a real Bible. You don't have to confront me later. 15 years ago, I got a Bible in the mail that had no words in it. 
It was just an advertisement. And I thought, I'm going to use that someday. Today was that day, right? It's been on my shelf for 15 years. But, but here are two ways that we live that out, that we're tearing pages out of the Bible, ignoring the Bible, subtracting from the Bible. This is them. We ignore our reflection, or we ignore what's in the mirror. James 1, to 25 says this, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like you're glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. See, sometimes we look in the mirror and instead of saying, oh, my hair's messed up, we say, what's wrong with that mirror? We take the mirror off the wall and we, we throw it away and we say, all right, I don't need a mirror anymore. We don't let scripture be the mirror that it's designed to tell us who we are and where our faults are and where we're walking away from God and not obeying his commands. Let scripture be a mirror. Don't ignore your reflection. The other way that we subtract from the Bible is we, we put off surgery. Here's what I mean by that. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Sometimes the Bible needs to be used like a scalpel in our lives. Sometimes the Bible needs to cut out some infection and remove a little something that's not been good and has been festering for a while. And when we don't let scripture do that, we're denying its power, we're ignoring its power, and we're setting aside its power. So don't put off surgery. Let scripture be a sword. Let scripture do what it needs to do. This theme that we've been talking about today of of obeying God's commands and walking with him, walking in light is all throughout the book of 1 John. In fact, in 1 John 5, it says this, 1 John 5, 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God and everyone who loves the father loves his children too. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the son of God. So what does it look like to to walk in light, to obey these commandments? What does it look like to know God, be a child of God and do the things that we're supposed to do? Well, Jesus invited us into that and said it very simple this way, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. When you realize that you've been trying to balance the scales and do everything on your own, and when you're ready to admit that you're lost in your sin and that you're not enough, but that Jesus was enough and what Jesus did on the cross is enough, you can trust him, you can surrender your life to him, you can know his love, and you can put your faith in the fact that you don't have to win the battle. He won the battle. Jesus said it very simple in those verses. In verse 28, he said, come come to me for peace. Don't try to find peace in yourself or peace anywhere else. Come to me for peace. I am peace. And then he said, live in combination with me. Live your life with me. It's a partnership. We'll walk together and I will take your burdens and I won't burden you because in me, you will find peace and relationship. He says, and you'll have your best life. That's what Jesus is offering in a surrendered life to him. A life of peace, a life of purpose, a life of hope. When we lay down who we are and say, I'm not enough, but Jesus, you are. And so the thing that I I wanna ask today is, have you made Jesus your foundation? Not just do you know of Jesus, have you thought about Jesus, do you talk about Jesus? Is Jesus your foundation where you have said, I am not enough, I'm lost, I'm covered in sin and I need Jesus to come into my life and make it whole and make it right. I need him to atone for the things I've done and set my life free. I want to experience his peace and relationship with him. If you would want to talk more about that, we would love to talk to you at the next steps table today. 
We would love for today to be the day that you begin a relationship with Jesus, that you know peace. And for those of us in the room who would say, yeah, I have a relationship with Jesus. I I know Jesus, but it's not always easy to follow him. I think you need to ask the honest question, Lord, what have I removed or ignored from your commandments? What part of your word am I ignoring? What part of your word and, and the things that the Holy Spirit has put in my life, in my heart, am I not paying attention to? Is the story of my obedience pointing to your love? Or is the story of my obedience or lack thereof pointing to my selfishness or my ignorance? And let's lean into relationship with Jesus. Let's lean into knowing him and knowing his commandments and pursuing intimacy. Those who say they live in God should live their lives like Jesus did. So spend time with Jesus. Spend time in God's word and let it be a mirror and let it be a sword. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Lord, thank you no matter what is going on around us, no matter what is pulling us under, no matter what is covering our lives, no matter what is attacking us, Lord, we can be anchored in Jesus, not because of anything we've done, not because we're good enough, not because we can fight our own battles, Lord, because we have faith that Jesus is enough and that Jesus came and gave his life for us as our advocate and our atonement. God, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that's thinking about saying yes to a relationship with Jesus, saying yes to surrendering their life to him, Lord, I pray that you will draw them toward peace and draw them toward hope, Lord. There is mystery there. But God, give them the faith, give them the strength to walk toward you and say yes to being found in you. God, for those of us in the room that ignore your commands, ignore your words and basically tell the world a different story about your love and maybe pronounce ourselves as liars and hypocrites. God, help us to know what you're saying. Help us to know what you're calling us to do. God, give us the strength to be obedient and just let your word be a mirror and a sword in our lives and in our hearts and to do the work and to do the surgery that it needs to do. God, we want to walk after you. We want to follow you. We want to be in relationship with you. Give us the strength to do that today and this week. It's in the name of Jesus I pray, amen.